All right, I want to introduce our guest speaker this morning. Many of you don't need an introduction. Um, I think Carl even said that he knew him before he was born. So and that's true because Carl uh, is, is friends with this man's parents. But we want to welcome Caleb and Sarah Burdett. Uh, they're two children, Chloe and Pax. You may have seen them uh, wander around the church this morning. But Caleb shared with us in Sunday school that they are church planners in the town of Logroño, Spain. They've been there about seven years. I think they've been in Spain a total of nine years. Um, and it, what's, what's great about Caleb and Sarah is, is, like I said, many of us have known them for many years. You know, I, um, I've been here for eight years now, but they, they were here long before I was here. And so uh, Caleb spent part of his growing up years in this church. And so they hold a, a special place in our heart. We, as a church, we support them and their ministry, uh, both through prayer and financially. Uh, his sending agency is, a, is an organization called the Baptist Mid Missions. And um, anyways, we want to welcome Caleb to come up and share God's word with us this morning. And there you are. I keep looking at your wife and you're here. All right. Thanks, Pastor. Good morning. Good morning. It's been a couple of years since uh, I was here in October of 2022. Uh, but it's been five years since Sarah was here. My son Pax has never been here. Five years since Sarah and Chloe were here. Uh, but as we go to the Lord and open up his word, would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this body of believers here. I thank you for the ministry that they have been to me as I was a part of this body uh, for seven years before uh, you led me to school in North Carolina, but the continuing friendships and mentorships and investment that this, many of these individuals have had on me personally, but then this uh, family of believers has had on me corporately and on my family. I thank you for your word that unites us in the gospel. Uh, Father, the gospel is something, uh, it's a, a wonderful message that we just heard but I pray that it would be true of us that as we have received him, so walk in him. Realize that uh, you don't just save us to leave us there. You save us to walk in newness of life. And I thank you that through your word, we can experience that progressive sanctification. And, and we look forward as we have sung just a few minutes ago to that day when, when we won't have this baggage of sin that we struggle with every day. Father, as has been mentioned, there's probably people here that don't understand what it means to have their sins completely forgiven once and for all. And I pray that you would be working in their hearts right now, even before this service. And there's been people praying just for that. Uh, Father, I pray that you'd work in their hearts to the point that they would uh, speak with someone before leaving today to make sure they understand what it what it means and how they can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that your word would go forth today, that it would not be my opinions. There's no need for my opinion here in, in this time, but if your word is faithfully expounded, Father, it can be of benefit to, to myself and to all those here. So we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I could tell you exactly where I was my senior year of college. I went to a school called Piedmont Baptist College in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, but where I was in my senior year of undergrad, where I was sitting, uh, when the professor put out this question to us, he said, are you okay with ambivalence in your soul? Uh, they got to understand, I was homeschooled, so my hand went up because I had no idea what ambivalence meant, okay? <laughs> But basically he was saying, are you okay with not getting the answer to your why God question? Are you okay with not getting the answer to your why God questions? When you're struggling with the uncertainties of life, when you're faced with bullying in school, now if you're homeschooled, that's, a, that's another subject right there, if you're getting bullied in school. When it appears that you're following Christ uh, and are suffering while those who mock him seemingly prosper. When you, follower of Christ, work twice as hard in your job uh, while your coworker, who doesn't follow Christ, receives the accolades and the promotion and the raise. 
and you're left behind. When you suffer unjustly, when life just doesn't seem to make sense. When you lose a child. When you have a, a spouse that's unfaithful. To whom? To, where do we turn? To whom do we turn? How do we make sense of that idea of the unjust sufferer? I'm going to invite you to, to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. We're not really going to camp out here, but I want to read this verse, and many of you wouldn't even have to turn there. Uh, but in Romans chapter 8, there's a verse that we like to put on our walls. We like to... Uh, be, because if you grew up in Awana like I did, you memorized it. We know that all things work together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. And then there's 29. For those whom he formed, he almost predestined to be conformed to the image. God has a plan with redeeming us, not just to leave us there, but that we would be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be firstborn among many brothers. And so when it's talking about the good for those who love him, the good is being conformed to his image. And you know what? Many times in my life, I've thought of that verse as good things for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Good life, good health, good job. And I have sometimes too often prioritized those things above being conformed to the image of my Savior. Uh, now, like I said, we're not going to camp out in that verse. I, I, I just wanted to, that's kind of like the, 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 the fabric, the filter through which we'll look at what we're going to. Um, but in actuality, we're going to be doing kind of a book study. Now, don't worry. I know the time. It's going to be like a book study from 30,000 feet. Normally, uh, on a Sunday morning, when I am teaching in our church in Logroño, We'll just do a verse by verse study, and right now they're going through 1 Corinthians. It's been the last, it's, it's taken us about 42 weeks to, to cover that. It's been a real uh, growth period for all of us, myself included. Um, but when I have an opportunity to speak like a, one setting like this, sometimes I'll do something a little different. Actually, I really just appreciate when we're doing a book study verse by verse because you don't have to worry about picking what to preach on you know I love it when somebody just gives me a text that says preach on this um, but uh, if you want to turn there the book study that we're going to be doing right now is the book of Job uh, it's an interesting book now like I said it's going to be 30,000 feet so it's not like we're going to be reading 42 chapters or even a verse from every chapter or anything like that but we're going to we're going to look at this and we're going to draw some uh, some principles and some applications from this. It's an interesting book. The author, or the narrator, speaks from an omniscient viewpoint, as it were, but there's no stated audience. You know, many of, it's a very a good practice of biblical interpretation is to say, who, who wrote this? To whom is he writing? For what purpose? Uh, you know, is this, are we talking about, uh, is he talking to uh, pagan nations in some of the books like Nahum? Is he talking to the nation of Israel? Is he talking to the church? What's this all about? Um, but this one, there's no stated audience. It's just kind of out there. Um, that, of course, doesn't keep scholars from speculating, you know. Uh, that's what their job is, right? But we can only go so far with those kind of speculations before realizing if God didn't make it clear from the text who, who wrote it and to whom, it really doesn't matter that much for us to, to be able to, to draw out a faithful interpretation uh, God didn't make it clear, so okay, I'm not going to spend time on that. Uh, we don't need that to be able to apply it to our lives here uh, in September of 2024. And you know, this book is old. It's very old. In fact, the language and vocabulary of this book have led many to believe that perhaps it was the first book of the Bible written it. Some of you, if you've written through a chronological Bible, sometimes they put Job first or after Genesis, but uh, understanding that, that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, some think, especially from the language of like he's uh, sacrificing, doing sacrifices for his family. Maybe it was even like around the time of Abraham, or maybe he was just not a Jew. Maybe he was from another nation like Edom or, or another nation around the, the land of Israel. So, but the good news with all these things is for simpler folks like me, it doesn't really matter, you know? 
God didn't share that with us. So it doesn't affect the message that the Holy Spirit wants to convey to you and me today. Uh, you may be very well versed in this story. You know, I, I can actually tell you that the first time I can really remember going through the book of Job, I was 14. It was on Sunday nights here. Uh, it was when we were in the other building and Pastor Carl went through there. And I can still remember the really bad kind of dad joke that he told about, you know, <laughs> there was these three friends and we don't really know much about them except this one guy, he was really short because he was just a shoe height, you know? And <laughs> so be careful with your jokes because certain things is what sticks, you know? <laughs> so, um, uh, thinking about that, that's, uh, that's 25 years ago. But you know, if you're teaching a, a kid study, a youth, children, many of those things, you don't know what's going to stick with them. Be faithful in that. Don't think that, oh, it's when we get to adults that that's when it really is important. Many of you can remember a teacher when you were seven, eight, nine years old in school that really impacted you and, and kind of changed the course of your life, perhaps. Uh, so, Back to, back to what we're talking about. <laughs> uh, you may be very well versed in this, or maybe you, you're, you're new to the study of scripture and you've, you've never heard this. And so I wanna kind of give you the cliff notes of, of the story. Um, I don't actually even know if they have cliff notes anymore, but when I was in university, uh, I say university because that's what they say in Spain. College is like elementary school <laughs> in Spain. <laughs> So uh, I'm like, yeah, I went to college when I, they're like, you went to college when you were 20, what? Anyway, so when I went to university, if you hadn't done all the studying, you look for the cliff notes. And it was before internet was like, really, you know, you could Google anything. Uh, so we would look for the cliff notes. So let's try to do that. Well, the story interest, opens with an interesting scene in heaven in which Satan pays God a visit. And uh, first off, that's like, that's, that's just weird to begin with. Uh, it, it, and there appears to be sort of this taunting of Satan by God himself as he asks in, in verse 8. He says, have you considered, the Lord says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Um, you're like, what are you doing, God? <laughs> But he's asking Job this, and the statement is not to glorify Job. That's really important that we set the stage here. It's not to glorify Job, but God is underlying the merits of following the Creator wholeheartedly. But Satan does what he always does. He twists the truth. Uh, it, exactly what he did in the garden when... Uh, Eve says the words of God. Maybe she added to it when she says, or touch it. Uh, but he says, did God really say that? And he's doing the same thing here. Uh, he, he downplays the virtue of obedience and tries to sow doubt in what God has spoken. Uh, look at what he says in, in, in verse 9 of the first chapter. Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Uh, he's doing it for a reason. And then he goes on to say, basically, Job's just serving you for the goodies he gets. I, I mean, you've given him, it says in the text that he was the wealthiest man in the land. He had these 10 beautiful children, and he had just wealth, health, prosperity, protection, all these things. And Job's like, no biggie. Okay, you've given him these things. Who wouldn't serve you for that? Uh, and do you know, it's totally possible, and it's even probable, that some of us here, you could be you today, that that is the extent of your relationship with God. That you follow Christ for the goodies you could get from God. You, perhaps you appreciate how attending a service like this, you can hear great music, you can kind of get your conscience soothed by being part of a, a group of believers gives you a sense of spirituality. Maybe you like the, the positive influence it is on your kids and, and all these things are true. But perhaps you, you might even think that it gives you a, a bit of favor with God to be in a group like this. Like I've, I've kind of check off, yeah, I went to church, I, I did that. And if that's you today, I have some really bad news. Because the Bible makes it very clear that I could never earn God's favor. Never through, uh, no merit of mine will ever earn God's favor. And worse, as we heard from Pastor Clark, there's a, there's a penalty uh, for the condition with which we're born. 
the sin condition which we were born. And the, the evidence that we are born with that sin condition, just look at my son Pax, okay? You can look at me too, but it's very evident my son Pax, because I mean, I will say, don't hit your sister. And then he'll just like slap me across the face. And I'll be like, oh, wasn't ready for that, okay? We are born with sin, and the evidence is that we continuously rebel against a holy God. The penalty for that is death. Not just physical death, but eternal death and separation for God. And I hope no one leaves today without grappling with the weight of what I just said. And it's not me saying that. That's God's word saying that. Because it's terrible news of our eternal fate if it depends on our merit. We'll come back to that later. But for now, back to the story of Job. So Satan contends, Job is just worshiping God to receive good things from God like health, wealth, protection. However, God, God pushes back at that and challenges the word of Satan and says, go ahead, take these things away. I give you permission. You see that uh, in verse 12, the Lord said, behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. Does that shake you? That might shake you that God would say such a thing, but I want, I want to push back on that a little bit. Before we go any further, let's just stop and say what an incredible comfort it should be to us to realize from this text that Satan can do nothing without God's permission. Did you get that from the text? And sometimes I don't even like to think that, but what else are we left with? We are left with a God who is not all powerful. And God, Satan doesn't have any permission to do that until God gives it to him. Why is God doing that? We're, we're going to wrestle with this a little bit. Satan can do nothing without God's permission. There's nothing that's beyond God's control or his authority. He's all powerful, all knowing, and woven together through these attributes is the fact that he is holy, he is just. And he is good. Sometimes you and I like to be the judge of what we think is good. But we have to look to scripture and look at our Savior to know what is good. Before we go further, let's just praise God that he is good, that he is all powerful. Sometimes we use that in a word saying he's, he's sovereign. And, and sometimes they use that word with leaders <laughs> or nations. They say, the America has a sovereign nation. Oh, God is the one who, who holds that title. So the way Satan goes to work is mischief. And really, mischief isn't a good word. It's utter and sheer havoc. And in six verses, we're given this rapid fire success, succession, an account of as one after another, messengers arrive to give Joe's news of calamity that has befallen him. His oxen are stolen by raiders, and his servants who had kept them were all slaughtered save one. Only one survived to tell the tale. His sheep consumed by fire. Is it, is it talking about uh, lightning, or is it some kind of a divine occurrence? Uh, and the shepherds, too. Only one survived to tell the tale. His camels also carried off by marauders, and, and those servants slaughtered as well. Only one survived to tell the tale. And then, as if all that wasn't enough. His 10 children said it was habitual that they would gather and it seemed like there were seven sons and three daughters that they would gather each day of the week in another home to have a, a feast. And they were together and some sort of great windstorm immediately toppled that house and they were all inside and all killed. Only one, not of his children, one servant survived to tell the tale. And all these events happening just like that seem to hold a divine or at least a paranormal element to them. But surprisingly, in the face of such ruinous loss and grief, Job doesn't act as we would expect if we were reading this for the first time. But he praises God. I can't really even comprehend that. However, Satan flippantly says that this is because Job didn't suffer personally bodily harm. Thus, once again, God gives him permission. God pushes back and gives him permission to harm Job's physical body, but is instructed to spare his life. And thus, Satan does. 
inflicting Job with terrible boils and sores all over his body. The only thing he can find any kind of relief is just to scrape it with broken pottery. And he's sitting there with his clothes torn in dust and ashes and a sign of immense grief, especially in the culture of that day. And at this point, such is the devastation that his own wife, in the midst of her own unspeakable grief, just says, Job, just curse God and die. Uh, I'm not going to be too hard on Job's wife because any one of us would say the same thing if we were in that place. About this time, some of Job's friends, three of his friends, arrived to town, having traveled from, from some distance, it seems, about hearing the news of the disaster that had befallen him, and they presumably come to comfort him in his time of distress. And this is where the meat of the story is. The three friends sit with Job in silence for three days without uttering a word. And I mean, right there, we could learn a lot from this at this point in the story. Uh, many times when a friend has experienced devastating loss, it's not going to be your words that bring comfort to that person. Uh, it's going to be your presence that will minister the most. Many times we do a disservice the moment we open our mouth. Such is the case in this story. Uh, even with Job, at the end of seven days, he breaks the silence by venting his frustration and uttering a curse upon the day he was born saying it would have been better had he never been born. And we can read this and understand this in the context and the culture as of that day as a lament. Uh, lament is not wrong. We see many godly examples of lament in scripture in, in the book of Psalms. We have an entire uh, book dedicated to that written by Jeremiah uh, entitled simply Lamentations. Uh, lament can be godly, and godly lamenting recognizes the fact that sin has so marked our world, disfiguring the face of the creation. But it also mourns longingly for the time when this world will be redeemed. The creation itself will be redeemed. And, and uh, Paul talks about that, that creation itself is groaning, longing for that time when the creation itself will be redeemed. But mostly here we hear from, we hear of the former from Job. He's just lamenting of the state of this world and the, and the suffering that it brings. But we're gonna be e easy with that too because you know what? When we read lamenta uh, lamenting in much of scripture, especially in the Psalms, Psalm 13 for example, it starts with, how long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? And then it ends just a few verses later with, from the Lord comes deliverance. But you know what? And I will praise the Lord. When we read those eight verses, we often uh, forget that may have been years, that process from the psalmist to get from, how long, oh Lord? Will you forget me forever? To the point where God graciously and lovingly and his mercy brought him to the point where he can say, from the Lord comes deliverance. Okay? So we need to remember that. We'll be patient with Job here, but we should also be patient with our loved ones who are going through difficult times. Maybe you know someone who is saying, how long, O oh Lord? And maybe they've been saying that for a while. We want them to get to that place where they're saying, from the Lord comes deliverance. But... We need to be patient with them, those who are walking through dark times. I can imagine just about every person here can bring to mind the balm it was in the midst of tragedy to have someone say nothing but simply be present, rather. Give you a hug, perhaps tell you they love you. And sadly, perhaps most, if not all of you, can remember a time in your life when you were hurting and the immense pain it caused by someone who with good intentions didn't know what to say and thus said too much. During the visitation of uh, Ian Romain, the eight-year-old son of our teammates who passed away a year and a half ago of, of a brain tumor, 
John, uh, as Jonathan and Hannah were there in the receiving line, 12 people put forward this question to them. So when are you going to be returning to Spain? I you know those were good intention, curious people who should have kept their mouth shut. It wasn't the right time. Okay? They should have just given them a hug and, and said, we love you. And God gave Jonathan and Hannah grace to, to accept that. You know, God in his wisdom, Jonathan even had said to Hannah, what are you going to do when somebody asks you that question in line? She said, no one would say that. <laughs> God in his wisdom had prepared Jonathan for that. This is, being quiet is what Job's friends should have continued to do, but his eldest friend just can't take this ranting any longer, and he feels it's his moral obligation to inform Job that no one suffers unjustly. So, scholars call this theology retribution dogma. You know where I first heard that? I was 14. We heard it several, several weeks in a row, retribution dogma, so I remember that. <laughs> In other words, there's some hidden or unknown sin in your life, Job. You just need to repent. That God rewards good behavior and he punishes bad behavior. In other words, there's some hidden unknown sin that explains this calamity. And we're here to help you find it out. And you know what? It's not a bad thing necessarily when struck with some sort of difficulty to to do what the psalmist says and says, Search me, O God, and see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Uh, we, we find in Hebrews that he says, God disciplines and scourges every what? Son. Every child. And it, it's the loving discipline of a loving father. And he says, if you're never disciplined by the father, chances are you're not a child of God. Chances are you don't have a relationship with him. So it's, it's not, a bad, I think, not a bad idea personally when you are struck with difficulty to ask God, is, is this something, is there some sin in my life that is causing this? But we, we need to be really careful when approaching someone else and, and jumping to conclusions in that regard. And the thing is in this text, it tells us that that's not why Job is suffering this. It, 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 the author even glowingly, uh, almost uh, hyperbole, using hyperbole exaggeration, talks about Job's character. Uh, but Job's friends were viewing God through a one-size-fits-all, blessing for good behavior and retribution for wrong behavior. But our God is so multifaceted. Job's three friends repeatedly misrepresented God and thus ensues this sort of tit for tat. One of his friends saying, basically, Job, there's some sin in your life. That's why this is happening. Job saying, I haven't done anything to deserve this. And Job stands firm in his defending his innocence, making known his desire, interestingly enough, to have a face-to-face with God. An An explanation from the Almighty or perhaps... In a few places, he asked for an arbiter, a go-between, uh, someone to represent him before the holy God. And this is very interesting because it's a foreshadowing, uh, being inspired, the author of scripture, it's a foreshadowing of an arbiter that would one day indeed go between us and a holy God and the person of Jesus Christ, stand between us and the wrath of the Almighty. But continue on, Job's three friends misrepresent God repeatedly But you know what, friend, you and I are in danger of doing the same thing. Uh, What's going to keep us from following into the same trap? And I'll tell you what's not sufficient. A Sunday and Wednesday relationship with God. If you are not spending time in God's word, making that a habit, it's not going to be sufficient to just come and try to uh, eat from God's word and even engorge yourself on Sunday. I think that's going to be enough. Nobody here eats once a week or even twice a week, okay? And you need that to be sustained by God's word on a daily daily basis. Uh, maybe some of you have been uh, in a job sometime when you have to travel extensively and be away from your spouse. Anybody who has to experience that knows the strain that it can put on a marriage relationship. 
can you imagine what would happen though? If today we have technology of calling and FaceTime and all these things like that. Can you imagine what would happen to my marriage if I talked to Sarah on Sunday and Wednesday and the rest of the week was just like, nothing? It's not going to go too well. Another thing, uh, you have to realize, each one of us has to realize our own dependence on God. Teenagers, young people, your parents' unwavering faithfulness to God won't be enough for you, okay? You've got to realize your own need for God and your own, cult, uh, cultivate your own relationship with Christ and realize your own dependence upon God. And especially in this age when some of you go off to college and stuff and you're just bombarded with people who, who will challenge your faith from day one. Do you have a real relationship with a real eternal creator? One thing I've heard uh, people say sometimes is, well, the Bible says, and then they will quote from the book of Job, like something that Eliphaz says or something. And you know what they're saying when they say the Bible says is they are intending to say the Bible teaches. And what the Bible is doing when it talks about from Job's friends is it's accurately recording the bad theology of Job's friends, okay? It's not saying do this, believe this, any of those things. So do you know how to rightly divide God's word of truth? You can't just depend upon your pastor to do that once a week for you. You've got to be doing that. Learn principles of scripture from good biblical teaching here, but do it in your own home on a daily basis. Uh, those people are incorrectly reading God's word, so you gotta be able to say, when someone says, the Bible says, you gotta know the context. So when somebody says something and it just seems wrong, Go and look up that passage. Don't just swallow everything you hear. We live in a day and age, they say, when we have the most resources biblically, but we are the most illiterate, biblically illiterate generation there has ever been. That's a really sad thing for us because we have so many resources and you can, you can listen to preachers that will tickle your ears all day long that sound good, that are fun to listen to, but you know how to get in and rightly divide God's word of truth. To know when somebody like the Bereans say, ah, this guy Paul's saying that, but we're going to go and see if that's really true. You know, let's study the Old Testament, see if that's really what a faithful interpretation. Know your Bible. Another thing, do you know that 95% of what Job's friends said was actually okay theology? Um, but if you have airtight theology, as is true in 95% of theirs, yet don't know how to properly apply it to your situation today, you're going to be, find yourself utterly devoid of any meaningful help in time of need. Back to our book study. We find, finally, towards the end of the book, a fourth of Job's friends talks. And he's one who's the self same youngest of the group. He wasn't mentioned before with those three friends. He's like, where did he come from? It doesn't tell us. Some think that perhaps he was actually the one who wrote the book. Um, he speaks differently and seems to portray Yahweh for who he is, Elihu. But in chapter 38, kind of the unthinkable happens because Job has been pining for, for a face-to-face -face with the Creator, with the Almighty, and God shows up. Uh, it doesn't say that he shows up visibly, uh, but it seems like he does show up audibly that, that they can hear. Chapter 38, verse 1, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. And then there's this barrage of questions, one after the other. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Do you see what God's doing there, what he's utilizing? Almighty God is utilizing sarcasm to Job. Who determined its measurement? Surely you know. Or who stretched out the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it 
and set bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no farther and here shall your proud ways stay. The song, uh, Behold Our God is based off of these passages. Who has, well, actually I'm, I'm not gonna try to quote it because I know it in Spanish better now, <laughs> so I'm gonna mess it up. But, uh, and then, then it says at the end, behold our God seated on his throne, no one can come. Job has an, uh, this encounter with God, but he sh he j the, the Almighty shows up, but it's not to answer Job's myriad of questions or explain this critical element that's very helpful to the story. Oh, there's been this scene in heaven. He doesn't even tell him that. In the spiritual realm, instead, God begins by asking a series of his own questions to Job. And they are questions that reveal the character of the Almighty to Job. What's the end result of this? Job has an awe-inspiring, fear-inducing encounter with the Almighty God of the universe. And his response is none other than complete shame and total humility that results in genuine repentance. Read with me his response in, in chapter 40. Job chapter 40, verse 3, Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand upon my mouth. I have spoken once. I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. And what does God do? He continues pushing into this. It's what Job needs. With all Job's suffering, God is using this suffering and he's using these questions to do what? To conform Job more to his image. Because in the beginning, we were created what? In his image. Sin has marred that. God wishes to conform us to his image. So continue on to chapter 42, when God finishes his questions and Job answers the Lord and said, this is a response, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak, he says, I will question you, and you make it known to me. Do you see the difference, his attitude here? He's not questioning God, why God? He says, I want to know more of you now. You've revealed your character and your person to me, and I want more. I, have heard, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. What is he saying there? No, I don't think he's saying that he actually physically saw God because we read in other portions of scripture where it says no man can see God and live. God's a spirit. Unless there was some sort of pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus Christ here. But I think what he's really saying based on the context is that I had heard, I had this knowledge of who you are. But now I have an understanding. I've seen your goodness, your character, your majesty. And what does he say beyond that? Because of that. Therefore, verse six, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. This is a great, you know, we hear the word repentance in scripture a lot. This is a great example of believing repentance. Someone who is already a follower of Christ, but they need to repent, not for salvation, but being conformed into the image of Christ. Do you know what repentance means? It means a change of mind. And throughout our Christian walk, if you're a believer in Christ, there's these moments of repentance where you need, we need to change how I saw, viewed God. Change how I saw, how I understood God. And it's God's word that primarily does that and his spirit using his word. He uses the community of believers around us to point out those blind spots in our lives. Please remember the narrator never, it doesn't tell us that God told Job, Job, <laughs> Job. Why, do we, why do we say Job? 
I mean, really? It's job, okay? <laughs> the narrator never tells us that God told Job what had happened in the heavenly realms, nor any of the reasons why. He never got the reasons, the answer to his why question. He simply reminded Job of his holy and awesome character and praised God. Job said, that's enough for me. In fact, as far as we can see from the text, Job was never in this life given an explanation for his unjust suffering. But his response at the end is basically, I rescind all my previous questions. I've been given a glimpse of the holy character of a holy God, and that's enough. It says that that pleased God. Furthermore, God instructed Job's three friends, you better have Job pray for you, or else I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and they did. They went to Job and says, pray for you. And Job, he's been humbled already, and he does that in an act of forgiveness. And it was in the summer of 2022 when I was walking into our meeting place preparing to lead our weekly English conversation group. And in the six years that we had had this English conversation group for adults, we had had interest in English, but very little interest in spiritual things. And the question crossed my mind as I was entering that night, I was the only one there. If we were suddenly taken off the scene, would anyone notice? My teammates, the Romains, were back here in the States as their eight-year-old son was battling a terminal brain tumor. My in-laws, who are part of our team as well, were also out or back in the States. Uh, and on this particular day, we were, even though it was 2022, this summer, we were still under COVID restrictions. And uh, as I felt the kind of the weight of isolation and discouragement, I audibly cried out to the Lord. And I banged my fist on the stair and I said, God, what am I doing here? Is there any use? What's the point? Would anyone even notice if we left? And, and like the answer, it was a rhetorical question because the answer in my mind was no. No one would notice if we left. And that night something rare happened in God's grace. Two of the attendees stayed behind to ask me about Ian, how he was doing. And it, it was in June and Ian had just, or maybe early July, Ian had just uh, been baptized because he had seen somebody else, I believe, get baptized and asked his parents about what that is. And they're like explaining, what is baptism? Well, it's identifying with Christ. It's not anything that saves us, but when, because obviously Christ was baptized, he didn't need to be saved. So uh, he, he instructs us to follow him in this act of obedience. It's the first act of obedience of a believer. And it's identifying with his death on the cross, his burial in the tomb, and his resurrection. Uh, and they, so they explain that. It, it's, it's an outward illustration of something that's happened inside. You know, when you, if you today are a follower of Christ, when you were born again, I couldn't see that change in your heart. Maybe I could see some of the outward expressions of that, but I can't really see your heart. You could fake it, perhaps. But we can see, that's why the church does it. It's the church that baptizes because the church is saying, as far as we can see, we believe there, this, repent, uh, this uh, salvation is genuine. This person really is a follower of Christ and we're gonna, uh, it's kind of like putting a stamp of the church saying, yeah, we believe this is true. Doesn't save anyone. Uh, and Ian said, I, I wanna do that. I, I'm a follower of Jesus. And so he was baptized. And I was able to <clears throat> just quoting Ian's words, share the gospel with these two people. And another thing that Ian had, had mentioned in that same month, he said to his grandfather, granddad, I'm not afraid of dying. Now, he didn't, he didn't know that he was going to die. His parents never said, you have a terminal brain tumor, you will die. No one ever lives beyond two years with this type of cancer, most not beyond nine months. They never said that. There's no need for that weight on an eight-year-old. But he somehow, through the Holy Spirit, realized the gravity of that. He said, I'm not afraid of dying because I, I have Jesus. And I shared that with him. And someone that was the same age as me 
and a lady that was in her 70s, <clears throat> they just took, stood speechless there. And they stayed for 40 minutes talking with me and said, in our culture, we don't know how to deal with death. We hide it from our children. We don't talk about it because they don't have any answer for it. <clears throat> that night, the Holy Spirit rebuked me. It's so easy for us to work for results. For fruit, we might say, but in honesty, it's for oftentimes for prestige. <clears throat> and it can sound like this, God is really blessing our ministry. But the translation is, look at how God is using me. Friends, I need to tell you that I've begun to change my vocabulary. I now say, God is doing something special in Logroño. Christ is building his church there, and we're so privileged to be able to join him in what he's doing. The Lord used uh, the study by Henry Blackaby, Experiencing God, and I imagine some of you have gone through that before, where he says, God is always working around you. It's our job to recognize where he's working and join him in that. <clears throat> if an unbeliever mentions anything about God, even if it's a joke, you know that the Holy Spirit is working in their life because it says no man seeks after God. Wow. So we can move into that and say, God, God's working. Even if they're resisting, God's working in that person's life. We're so privileged to be able to join in what he's doing. You know what? If you and I or I are unfaithful, God's going to raise up somebody else because it's his promise to build his church. But we're privileged to walk with him and be used by him. So I ask you, believer, are you okay with not getting the answer to your why question? When you're struggling with the uncertainties of your life, why do the ungodly prosper when the just seemingly suffer, when life doesn't seem to make sense? I encourage you not to look for an explanation. <clears throat> look to the character of your God. Job never received those answers he was hoping for to all his questions and his pleads to have his case heard in a, before a judge. What he instead received was an encounter with a holy God. He found that was all he needed. I've had people tell us, uh, I think God is going to use the death and testimony of Ian to, uh, to bring a great harvest in Logroño. And it could be that God does. But you know, today, not one person has even come to our place, to our meeting place, to our church as a result of hearing Ian's story. Not one believer, not one visit from somebody hearing that and say, I want to hear what you're talking about. Do you, you see how we long to make sense of suffering? This happened to this person so that... And in, in essence, some of those things are temporal things. We long to have like a temporal comfort for a suffering that might really just be reaping eternal rewards. And you're not going to see it in this life. God says, gaze on my holiness, my goodness, my love. Meditate on who I am and what, have I, what I have done. And you might be saying, Caleb, did he do? I mentioned previously that there's some really awful news concerning us. That coming to this world, we, we're destined to an eternity in hell separated from God. But I didn't mention that good news. It's already been mentioned once, Pastor Clark, but you may not have been listening. Coming into this world, we have that destiny, but God intervened in the story. We see that from the first pages of scripture. Man sins and God says in Genesis 3.15, you blew it, I am going to intervene. You can't, I'm gonna send a savior. And all the Old Testament is preparing us for that when he's gonna fulfill that promise. God intervened in this story and it made a way for you and I to be made right with us. It's not based on your merit or my merit, Rather, it's based on the merit of his son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth and being sinless, he was the only one who could take your punishment and mine. He paid for our sins because the punishment of sin is death. He died on the cross in our place and assuring us that that debt was paid in full, 
and that he was God, he rose from the dead. And by part, I can partake of this free gift, I'm given the choice to place my faith, and I like to use the word confidence. Sometimes we think of faith as like the force from Star Wars, like, do you have strong faith? <laughs> faith, let's simplify, it's placing my confidence in Jesus and his work. The Bible calls this act of placing my confidence in Jesus the new birth. This is how I became a child of God. I confess, yes, God, I believe what your word says about me, that I'm a sinner. I deserve eternal punishment, that I need a savior. I believe what your word says about God, about Jesus, that he took my punishment, my death. And I believe that this act offered me eternal forgiveness. If you've never done that, and you wish to have eternal life, friend, you can do that right now. Just talk to God. There's, there's no special language. It's a conversation with your creator. And don't hesitate. If you want to talk with someone after, talk to Pastor John. Talk to one of these guys in the sound booth. Talk to myself. Talk to somebody beside you. How can, I didn't quite understand what that redneck was saying up there. When we're faced with difficulty, don't seek the answer to our why question. Focus on, on the character of God and his goodness. And one day, we'll know, but it may not be in this life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you that you are a God who lovingly disciplines us when your children stray. But God, sometimes we suffer and that's not the case. It's just for the praise of your glory as you speak of in Ephesians. I pray that you would mold us more and more into the image of your son that when we're faced with those times, uncertainties in life, uncertainties in a nation, uncertainties in a family, that we say, okay, God, teach me. I wanna know more about who you are. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.